us have a look-see at the Wagner HT 3500 heat gun, also known as the Milwaukee MHT 3300, as well as a number of other brand house brands. So this is an OEM type made in China heat gun. The advertising wonk for this says that it is a digital heat gun and you can tell it's digital by these little membrane switches on the back and some LEDs. Looks like something from Star Trek I suppose. However, you know that what lies beneath is a really chintzy craptacular circuit board. And you know that they cheaped out on these because, well, this product's actually been recalled. The Wagner for certain date codes, as well as the Milwaukee for all date codes. This Wagner is, uh, well, you shouldn't use it if it has a date code and you can read on the bottom. So you can find it here. Yeah, this one here is an E864R. And fortunately, that is okay. So this is not going to set my house on fire. Uh, but if you have one of these, if you get one of these on the used market, make sure that you look up the link I'll post below the video and that you're actually getting a decent model. So yeah, they, they cheaped out on the board. They probably under a the component in here and what happens is it burns out and this thing doesn't shut off. Or the fan shuts off, but the heating element keeps running and like, well, that's, that's a problem. And you know, even if it wasn't for the, uh, for the product recall, there's actually another YouTube video out there of a guy who had to fix uh, some problem in the circuit board because of an under spec capacitor and um, the, his capacitor fried or blew or whatever and and yeah, I'll, I'll link that video below you can see how to fix this heat gun should, well, should that eventuality ever happen. Nonetheless, I want to have a look-see at this gun because I think it's a really good test case to examine good versus bad design and what's uh, what's desirable and what's not in a heat gun. So let's have a look-see at it. Certainly this gun has some good points. It has some really chintzy points. And it has some weird design decisions, but let's go through them. Let's start off with the good points. Yeah, the first good point is that it looks like a Star Wars blaster. That actually is a good point. Because all tools nowadays look like friggin' transformers. They, they've got all the black overmolding and they look like they're made to do warp 7 or warp 8 or something like that. This one here is a lot more down to business, uh, really. It, it's Even though it looks like a blaster, I actually believe that most of the design in this gun is quite functional. For instance, let's start off with the plastic. Uh, the plastic is quite solid. It, it, it's very rigid. There's no give whatsoever in the case, even here at the, the heat vents. I, I, I really can't press it down. My guess is that it's some sort of glass-filled plastic. Um, well, I'll take it apart soon and we'll, we'll try to figure out whether that really is the case or not. But it, it seems like it's a decent sort of plastic. Second thing I like about it is that it doesn't have the friggin' overmolding. I think overmolding is just way, way overblown nowadays. Why, why do it? it? It's it often doesn't serve any purpose. In fact, I think it's a liability because really overmolds. Uh, is the plastic going to age differently? Uh, how is it going to react with different solvents? How about heat from the gun itself? Over a long time, over a long period, I have seen a number of places on the intertube that that overmolding does seem to die before the main plastic body does. You really don't need overmolding. It's it's lightweight. It has very good grip. It has this little trigger finger thing which which looks kind of stupid, but because it doesn't actually do anything. But really, it's for your finger to hold it, and it's just to give it some extra grip. And that, that's pretty good. Yeah, the handle's well designed. Um, I have about a medium hand, maybe a little bit medium small. I don't know. Somebody with like like a 300 pound gorilla dude, he, he'd have no problem with this. I don't think even somebody with dainty little digits would have a problem with this either. It's 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 a it's a good ergonomic handle. So that's a good design point. Another design point is the um, the, the speed stripes down the side. It, it looks like it's maybe just for for show or something, but it's not. 
This one, the gun is hot. You can lay it down on your bench, and the hot plastic isn't going to, like, I don't know, ignite gasoline or something on fire if you're stupid enough to use it around gasoline. Yeah, yeah, those rips, they're, they're, they're just to protect your surface. They're a little bit overkill, because I've never found that this plastic, even, even here, I've never found it really got hot, even after extensive use. Another part of its Star Wars blaster appearance is having this kind of an angled sort of a look to it. It's like a blaster that you shoot. But I think there's a reason for it. Take a look at this, this uh, display panel with the, all of these lights. It's at an angle, and I believe the angle is for a reason. Let me fire it up and put it down into its vertical position. And what you see is when it's down in its vertical position, you can actually see the light shining in the shadow. That way, if you're in a noisy work environment, you know to, like, not touch the top and, and, and burn yourself, you can maybe see. It's not ideal. I think what would be better is to have a light near the top to warn potential users. It's a useful position to have it if you're doing heat shrink tubing or some other task. Another nice design feature is... Shut off. It runs the motor without the heating element on, and that cools the element down, makes it last longer. So, there are some well thought through things on this heat gun, I do believe. Couple other nice features, it has a tether point, fairly, fairly good strain relief for the cord. And right, now let's look at the chintzy. This power cord sucks. It's a thermoplastic cord SJT, and it's really, really stiff. I'll show you in a moment. It's rated at only 60 degrees Celsius for a heating appliance that draws supposedly 1,500 watts? 60 Celsius, wow. Very stiff cord, despite being only 16 wire gauge. I have a gander at this SJO cord, 105 degrees rated, 12 wire gauge, and it is just way more flexible. You can see it's considerably thicker than this heat gun power cord, but this is very flexible. This extension cord, I can throw it on the ground. It just unwinds and it's really a pleasure to use. Brand name? Yip Chun. At least it's Underwriters Lab rated. This power cable sucks. Check this out. It's supposed to be able to put this down on its rear end to aim it upwards. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, again. This is how I'd normally store it in the drawer. That's what a lot of people are going to do. I know you're not supposed to do this, but I do it anyways, because what the fuck else are you going to do with this cord? Anyways, you take it off, and it's like a friggin' spring. It's, it's just not flexible whatsoever. You plug it into your outlet. If you want to use it on your bench, let's say, and you've got all sorts of electronic crap all over your bench, you just want to, like, heat up some heat shrink tubing. This cord sweeps across and just knocks everything kerflying. The other major point of chintziness are these membrane switches. These membrane switches, they just don't... They don't have a really good tactile response. And what I end up doing, especially when I'm busy working outside or something, is just to make sure I press it well, I end up using my, th my thumbnail and... Uh, it's going to eventually wear those switches out. You can see they're already already getting banged up. Fortunately, it's, it's, it is a, it would only be low voltage here and behind this panel, but uh, not very good. Hey, okay, now on to the weird. Look at the interface. You've got a power button here, you got a temperature up, temperature down, and you have a button that is mysteriously labeled select. Let's fire it up, and you can see we get four LEDs of power. And you can adjust the amount of heat by pressing these sucky tactile switches. And it's in low mode. And the low mode is yellow, which would indicate at the moment putting out 1250 Fahrenheit. You press that. It's now putting out 1350. Now what's kind of weird about it is that these two heat ranges have overlap. 
you'd imagine if they were heat ranges low and high, the low would be like the low range and high would be the high range, but you see there's app there's, there's complete overlap. You got 250 and 350, 450 and 550, 1250 and 1350. Like, what exactly is going on? Well, I figured out what's going on is that it is the select is mainly a fan switch. High power and low power. Okay. However, if it was just the fan, you would expect that on the lower fan speed, the heat would be hotter. That's because there's less air passing the heating elements, it's passing slower, so it gets heated up more. But if the temperature is lower than on the high setting, it would mean that it's not only throttling the fan, but it's also throttling the heat element. Now, I'm kind of perplexed as to why they have two different heat scales. Why not just choose one value in between? Because really, it's not going to be accurate at that nozzle. <laughs> Especially if you go like a centimeter or two or three or a couple inches away, this temperature is going to be nowhere near close to this reported value. So I, yeah, I don't know why they just didn't select one, one range or just call it even power level one, two, three, four, five, and six. It, it I don't know, it just seems kind of kind of a weird design choice to me. Let's take a look at another bad design decision with this interface. Turn it on, adjust the power, get it to just how I like, turn it off. Try to go through its cool down cycle. Now, did it remember my setting? No, didn't. To get back to my setting, you have to press these friggin annoying buttons again. All right, let's split this open like an overripe banana. Phillips number one, convenient. Inside. Okay, so here we have it gutted. Let's start with the business end, the heating element. Um, to my estimation, this heating element is not user serviceable. I've already pulled it out a little bit, and usually in heat guns, the sleeve, which is just the heat guard, is loose and can be pulled right off, and in, in many cases, the heating element underneath could be replaced. But in this case, the heating element is really st stuck in there tightly, friction fit. And if you can see in the end, I pulled it out a little bit, and it's already starting to pull out that insulation. And I, 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 I don't want to go any further than that. So let's just work with this. You can see a few things. So one thing that we can see is that there's a single heating element. This white line here comes from the circuit board, and this here is providing voltage, hot voltage, to the, uh, to the heating element. The black line here would be the neutral, and it takes the current back. Single heating element, unlike many guns, uh, the dual temperature ones usually use just two different heating elements. And to achieve the, the, the two different temperatures, either one element is on or both elements are on. Being a single element, this actually does have a little bit of a silver lining in that uh, if you vary the temperature, just lower the temperature a little bit, um, there will be less thermal stress on this element. It would last a lot longer. These heating elements, the heating wires, usually the weak point in, in any heating gun. So, that's that. What else can we see? This black and red line that we see here, they go up in a insulated, fiberglass insulated tube up to near the tip, and being very thin wire, I would presume that these are for a thermocouple to sense the temperature near the tip and they go back to the circuit board. We also have a thermal fuse here, and the thermal fuse would uh, hopefully protect it from overheating. The motor. Here we see the fan at one end, and at the other end, check out that dead bug rectifier bridge. Yikes. Hmm. 
So that what, what those four diodes are doing is they're rectifying AC voltage and they're giving the motor a DC voltage and that'll make sure that it runs in one direction. Okay, so that's the business end. Now let's take a look at the circuit board. Okay, these membrane switches are not directly connected to any pressure pads on the uh, circuit board, but instead they are plastic standoffs that actuate momentary switches. So that's a decent thing in that if you were to, let's say, break through one of these soft membranes, you're at least, you got at least a centimeter to any serious voltage that might be on this board. Unscrew the last screw here and have a look at this board. Okay, so what we see here is mostly low voltage on the surface, which would make sense because that's the user interface. However, I do see the AC hotline does come up and come through the board near here, which would be near the power switch. I can imagine if this switch was to wear out and I don't know, on a hot day, if somebody's just dr drenched and dripping in sweat, some electrolyte might come down and fry the board, but at least at least the user should be should be safe, hopefully. Note that the only ground is to the heating element. Uh, there's, there's, there's no grounding at the rear end. Here we see a LM358P, that's an op amp. Most likely that op amp is being used for the thermocouple. Um, it amplifies the signal off the thermocouple, uh, lets the microcontroller, that must be this ELAN unit, it allows the microcontroller to know when to shut the fan off in the automatic cooling cycle. It's possible that the thermocouple is also involved in a safety routine to throttle the power should the heating element be overheated. I'm not entirely sure of that because there is a thermal fuse here as well. Otherwise, components, uh, basic, nothing particularly special. Here's the capacitor that one gentleman on the intertube had an issue with. Rated only at 10 volts. All right, let's take a look at the obverse. In the obverse, what we see are two triacs, one big arse one. This one here must be regulating or providing the voltage for the heating element. The way it works is the, the microcontroller is going to be determining how often this is, it's like it's electronic switch, how often the switch is flipping on and off and giving, giving a certain amount of voltage um, anywhere between little and full to the heating element. Over here we see another triac, and this one here would be for the motor speed control. You can see here's where the power mains comes in. Here is a return for the power main. These two little guys are for the thermocouple. This one here, close to the small triac, is for the motor. And this somewhat heavier gauge wire closer to the big triac, that would be for the heating element. Soldering job, not very fantastic. Take a look at that gungy circuit board. About half the joints are nice and shiny, about half the joints are pretty dull, and there are some pretty globtacular and overheated carbonized joints like this one here. Yeah, not too fantastic. I guess they don't pay those 14 year old girls in the factories in China well enough. There's no markings on the plastic as far as I can see. I'm pretty sure, however, that it is some fairly decent plastic as it is thin yet quite stiff and we can at least see whether it's glass filled or not and you can hear that noise as the carbide point cutting through glass fibers presumably it's heat resistant okay here it's ready to go back together just some parting observations notice a splice here on the power lead and a splice here on the hotline the hotline's clamped in but this one's not the circuit board is not directly affixed to the case in any way. Um, the way it's affixed is it's fixed to the control panel and the control panel fits into a groove on the, the body of the tool.
Okay, let's see how easily this clips back together. There we go. Good quality plastics. You know when the screw is properly bottomed out. It's unlike cheaper ABS, which is very mushy and very easy to strip the screws. Definitely good quality plastic. Can get them nice and snug. Done. Okay, right, let's see how it behaves electrically. We've got 122 volts. Power it up. Starts in a medium mode. No 500 watts. Medium low. High temperature, low fan setting. A 720 watts. Select button. Fourteen hundred watts. Let's see what the lowest setting gives us. One hundred and fifty watts. Let's see how much this fan draws. Probably around 65 watts. Okay, so parting thoughts. Um, it's an okay heat gun. It's, it's one of the lowest price points for a variable temperature heat gun. Most of them, variable temperature heat guns, are, are well over 100 beans. And if you really like to have a low temperature, uh, that could be quite useful. Drying paint, heat shrink tubing doesn't require very high heat, drying out sensitive electronics, things like that. Also, on a lower temperature setting, the heating element would have, I would presume, a fairly long lifetime. Most heating guns, the, the cheaper ones with the little two-stage switch and the, the heating element just gets full voltage uh, no matter what, one or two of them. Yeah, th those are, are infamous for having a rather short lifespan of maybe 50, 60 hours. This one here at the default setting that you turn it on, I would think it would be longer than that. Um, but I wouldn't count on any miracles. Certainly, if you need to fix this, good luck. It, it's it's a throwaway tool. When it, when it's dead, it's 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 garbage. Also, if you're in the market for a variable temperature heat gun, I really do recommend instead of getting one of these digital panels. These digital panels are just I think that they're annoying. I, I think they're useless. It's way better to just get a some sort of a switchy thing here that you can adjust the temperature with a knob. And that way, it's always at the right temperature when you turn it on. You don't have to fiddle around with any electronics. Of course, the only exception would be like true high quality digital heat guns with an emissivity meter measure the temperature of the item that you're working on. So, do I have room for this tool? Uh... Yeah, it'll be at the back bottom of one of my cupboards, uh, mainly just for stripping paint. For my main use, which is heat shrink tubing and various other electronic uses, I think I'm going to upgrade from a Star Wars blaster to a retro Star Trek TOS phaser model, which will be eventually a future video. Until next time, remember, there's always room for tools. Even Wagner.